Christmas must be pretty important to Charles Dickens's novella A Christmas Carol, right? I mean, it's in the title for goodness sake. But the question is, how is the theme of Christmas used in Charles Dickens's story? Let's find out. Hello, 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 Revision Squad. How are you? It is me, Liam, aka Mr. Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and in this video we are going to think about the theme of Christmas and how it is used in Charles Dickens's novella A Christmas Carol. Now to do so, we are going to think about some key contextual information, look over some important quotations, and I will provide some ever vital analysis. So you know what? Make sure you've got a pen and some paper to hand, as I'm covering quite a bit. Now, I really do hope that this video helps you out as you study A Christmas Carol or, you know, revise for your exams. And if it does, please do let me know by dropping it a like, leaving a comment, subscribing to my channel if you aren't already, and sharing this video and my channel at large with your friends, classmates, and anybody else who you think might find it helpful. Honestly, your support really does mean an awful lot, so thank you so much in advance. Also, a quick disclaimer, I won't be talking about the religious connotations of Christmas in this video, as I will be making a separate video about Christianity and religion in A Christmas Carol at some point in the near future, so I just thought I'd say that now to clear that up. Alright, so first things first, some context. For many of the GCSE exam boards out there, your ability to apply your analysis of A Christmas Carol to its historical, political or social backgrounds is pretty important, so you need to make sure that you've got a solid understanding of its various contexts. So first of all, and you might think that this is a bit weird, we're going to think about pre-Victorian festive celebrations. And the reason why it is important for us to think about this is because when A Christmas Carol was published in 1843, the Victorian era was less than a decade old. This means that what became known as the traditional Victorian Christmas had not been fully established at this point, and so we might see some pre-Victorian traditions appear within the novella. So firstly, before the Victorians established what we might recognise as being Christmas festivities, elements of pagan wintertime festivals still lingered. Winter feasts were commonplace, which might be where the Christmas dinner came from, and it was a common pagan belief that hanging up evergreen plants, such as ivy, holly and mistletoe, would ward off evil spirits at wintertime. Furthermore, before he was seen as a figure that brought presents, an earlier version of Father Christmas was instead seen as a sign of the returning springtime. Remember, before he wore red and white, he wore green. Might this explain the Ghost of Christmas Presents appearance? Right, now that is enough about pre-Victorian traditions and beliefs. What can we say about the Victorian Christmas? Well, first of all, it is important for us to acknowledge that the Victorian era, especially as early on as 1843, was a time in which many Christmas traditions emerged. The Industrial Revolution is largely to thank for this. The general increase in wealth meant that a relatively affluent middle class emerged, and these people were able to take Christmas Day and Boxing Day off of work and spend it celebrating with their families instead. Furthermore, the improved railway system meant that many workers who had moved to the city from the countryside were similarly able to go home for the festive season. Overall, because more people were able to spend Christmas with their families, and because family was so important to the Victorians, new traditions and activities emerged that centred around family. For instance, in the Victorian era, Christmas trees were popularised. Now this was thanks to Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, who brought the tradition over from his native Germany. With the royal family being seen as the ideal family for others to follow, Christmas trees gradually became popular. Furthermore, the first Christmas card was sent in 1843, which I'm sure you know was the year in which A Christmas Carol was published. 
However, the penny post, which allowed people to send letters for only one penny, whereas their cost had previously depended on how far their letters were going, had been in place since 1840. Now, this meant that the Victorians were more able to send letters and eventually cards to their loved ones, especially at Christmas time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Christmas feasts had long been a thing, but in the Victorian era, Christmas dinners took on a much more familiar form. Turkey dinners became way more common, or at least they did for richer families. Roast beef was eaten by poorer families in the north of England, and in the south, goose was the meat of choice for less well-off families. Additionally, Christmas carols were revived and repopularized in the Victorian era. These songs were generally spread among the middle classes, but were also sung at churches, places where social barriers were seemingly less relevant. And the last idea that I will mention for now is that the Victorian era saw the exchanging of gifts at Christmas becoming more and more common. Now, gifts were mostly given to children and rich children at that, but the seeds of today's gift-giving culture were definitely sowed in the Victorian era. Now, all of this is to say that Christmas was becoming a family-centric event during the Victorian era, one that wasn't necessarily a hyper-religious occasion. However, I think it is important for us to stress that Christmas time, especially early on in the Victorian era, was an occasion for wealthier families. Poorer workers weren't automatically granted Christmas Day off, and the increasingly capitalistic holiday was not necessarily something that the working class could take part in as fully as their wealthier peers. Anyway, if that is some important contextual information out of the way, which quotations could we analyse in order to discuss the theme of Christmas? All right, if you've watched any of my other videos in this series, you will know what I'm going to say here. All of the paid references that will appear on screen over the course of this video relates to this copy of the book. Now, our page numbers will likely differ if we're using different editions of the book, but I hope that I still make the quotations easy enough for you to locate. Now, funnily enough, our first quotation doesn't actually have a page number, and that's because it appears in about a billion places in your copy of the story. You see, with the theme of Christmas in mind, I want to think about the novella's title. After all, it has the word Christmas in it, and so we must be able to say something about it in relation to the theme of Christmas, right? I reckon we can at least. You see, by including the word Christmas in the title, Dickens has foregrounded the importance of Christmas to the novella. Furthermore, I think we could say that Dickens stresses the universality of Christmas by naming the novella after carols more specifically. As I said only moments earlier, Christmas carols were something that people sung together at church regardless of their class, showing that their appeal transcended social boundaries. It could be argued then that Dickens's title already ties into his socially conscious message, as it has connotations of togetherness. Next up, I want to think about two different quotations. The first, spoken by Fred as he enters the story, is... A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! And the second, spoken by Fan as she tells her brother that he is able to come home in stave two, is... We're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. Now the question is, what can we say about these two quotations with regards to the theme of Christmas? Well, first of all, I would say that Fred's dialogue, which comes right at the start of the story, explicitly connects Christmas and family, which we all know was incredibly important to the Victorian era's emerging Christmas time traditions. Furthermore, Fan's dialogue in Stave 2 reinforces this connection between Christmas and family and has the effect of emphasising just how wonderful Victorian Christmases were, thanks to the superlative adjective merriest. 
So Fred and fans seem to think that Christmas is great. But what about Scrooge? His long-standing views on Christmas are expressed right at the beginning of Stave 1, when, in dialogue with Fred, the miser claims, Every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of Ollie through his heart. But what can we say about this in relation to the theme of Christmas? Well, I think it clearly shows that Scrooge does not value or really understand Christmas for whatever reason. But I think we can say something a bit more interesting about this quotation than that. At the start of the story, I'm sure you'll all agree, Scrooge is not presented as being a particularly nice character. In fact, he's pretty unlikable and incredibly unpleasant. Now, of course, he is not a real person, and so that means that Charles Dickens chose to make him such a deeply unpleasant and unlikable character. Certainly, the sort of character who you wouldn't want to be like. So if Scrooge is unpleasant, and is someone we wouldn't want to be like, we wouldn't want to share his views, would we? Therefore, I wonder if Dickens created an unpleasant character who also does not understand or value or honour Christmas in order to encourage his readers to embrace all of the positivity that Christmas actually does stand for. But what exactly does all that positivity entail? Let's have a look at another quotation, shall we? Thinking of all of the positivity that Christmas entails, I can't help but think about a quotation that comes from Fred, again from relatively early on in Stave 1. Speaking with his uncle, Fred says, I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. Now this presents Christmas time as a time of good virtues. Look at that list of adjectives that Fred uses. It is a kind, forgiving, charitable time. Now each of those adjectives combine to create an overall impression that Christmas time is a season of goodwill and love, a time of absolute bliss. Out of these adjectives, charitable really stands out to me as it shows that Fred is aware of the importance of thinking of the less fortunate during the festive season. However, he does also call Christmas time the only time he knows in which men and women, presumably relatively well-off men and women, consider the people below them to be equals, rather than another race of creatures. Now this makes me wonder, was Christmas time really the only time of year in which the well-off thought charitably about the poor. As much as Fred is a really nice character, has Dickens included this detail in his character's dialogue to create the impression that, as much as Christmas time encourages some members of the middle and upper classes to think about the poor, is this actually not good enough? Should the well-off in fact consider how to support the poor all year round? Should the Christmas spirit in fact be held all the time? Certainly, I think this makes sense, given what we know about Dickens' views. Alright, we're going to leave Stave 1 behind now. Instead, I would like to focus on Stave 3 for a bit. Now, the next two quite lengthy quotations occur when Scrooge first meets the ghost of Christmas present. The narration reveals... The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light. And then moments later, we are treated to even more detailed description, which reads, 
heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long reeves of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch. Whew, okay, blimey, those are two long quotations. What do I want to say about them then in relation to the theme of Christmas? Well, the first quotation on screen reminds me of some of the context I discussed earlier when we were thinking about pre-Victorian festive celebrations. Holly, mistletoe and ivy were commonly hung indoors under the pagan belief that doing so would ward off evil spirits. The ghost of Christmas present's arrival means that Scrooge's house is similarly decorated, which makes me wonder, might this festive decoration be seen as the ghost of Christmas present trying to ward off Scrooge's evil spirit? After all, this ghost is integral to Scrooge's transformation and redemption, and I wonder if this warding off might in fact contribute to this. In the second quotation, we get an incredibly long list, one that is full of an absolute abundance of mouth-watering Christmas foods. Simply put, I think that this quotation is indicative of the emerging Victorian Christmas traditions. Together, these quotations relate to Christmas traditions both old and new alike, which makes me wonder if Dickens has captured the state of Christmas celebrations in 1843 perfectly, still firmly rooted in the past, but looking forwards to something new and different as well. Still in stave three, I would like to have a look at a brief exchange held between Scrooge and the Ghost of Christmas Present which occurs when the miser notices the spirit sprinkling incense from its torch. Their exchange is as follows. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge. To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Now this dialogue suggests to me that Christmas time is actually quite difficult for the less advantaged, which is of course revealed by most, something we know to be true because of our contextual knowledge, with many of the working class having to work on Christmas Day and their celebrations paling in comparison to their more fortunate peers, it was far from the romanticised event that it was made out to be by the middle and upper classes. Staves three and five supply our next two quotations, and they relate to food. First of all, let's visit the Cratchit family's Christmas celebrations. In describing their dinner, Dickens writes, There was never such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose coat. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. And then in stave five, once Scrooge has woken up, he decides to buy the Cratchits a proper Christmas dinner, but not just any old Christmas dinner. As his question, not the little prize turkey, the big one, reveals, he plans on buying the big prize turkey in the poulterer's shop to give to the Cratchits. But why have I selected these quotations? Simply put, what can we say about them? Well, first of all, the Cratchit family's original dinner is markedly poor, not only because of its size, so the fact that it is eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes suggests that it is quite a small portion of meat, but also because of the type of meat that they are eating as well. Goose, if you remember from earlier, was something that poor people would eat at Christmas time in the south of England because they wouldn't be able to afford more expensive cuts of meat. Now similarly, Scrooge's newfound generosity at the end of the story is exemplified by both the quality and quantity of meat that he buys. Turkeys were something that only the rich ate at Christmas time in the early part of the Victorian era because it was especially costly to transport them 
And so the fact that Scrooge buys one for the Cratchits, let alone the biggest one going in the shop, really does show just how generous he is in doing this act. Huh. Who'd have thought that the difference between a small goose and a large turkey was so significant? All right, back to stave three more firmly. We're going to look at three short quotations that occur after Scrooge has seen the Cratchit Christmas celebration, but before he sees how Fred, Fred's wife and all their friends celebrate. Scrooge and the Ghost of Christmas Present travel far and wide and see a number of people celebrating Christmas in a variety of locations, such as a bleak and desert moor, a solitary lighthouse, the black and heaving sea. Simply put, I believe that by showing Christmas being enjoyed in various desolate locations, Dickens celebrates the universality of the festive season. If it can bring joy and happiness to people living in these disparate and seemingly unpleasant locations, which is suggested by adjectives such as bleak, solitary and then also heaving, then Christmas must really be the most wonderful time of the year. Speaking of how great Christmas can be, let's look at our last quotation, which comes from stave five. Once at Fred's house, Scrooge takes part in wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. This quotation is quick and easy, I think, because the repetition of the adjective wonderful shows how, once transformed and able to open his heart, Scrooge is able to fully engage with all the joys that's taking part in the Christmas festivities entails. This seems like a fitting end to the novella. At the beginning, Scrooge does not value or understand Christmas, and is a character who readers are encouraged to not be like. Now at the end though, Scrooge is a really positive character who clearly enjoys and values Christmas, and has become a character who readers are encouraged to replicate. He is a positive and jolly character now, but he is also one who knows the importance of looking out for the less advantaged. Perhaps this makes him better than many of Dickens's readers. All right, that is my analysis of all of those quotations complete. But please don't close the video just yet, as I have a summary, question, extra ideas and further recommendations still to come. So if we wanted to summarise how the theme of Christmas is utilised in A Christmas Carol, we could say throughout the novella, Dickens celebrates Christmas for its universality. No matter where you live or how rich or poor you may be, it is able to bring you and your loved ones great joy. By drawing on this theme in his writing, Dickens encourages his audience to be more considerate of the less advantaged, which ties into his socially conscious message. So this summary is useful as it discusses Dickens' possible intentions using an evaluative verb and uses plenty of keywords, universality, joy, and those various references to wealth. It's also relatively concise as well. If you think it will be useful to copy this down, either to use as an overview or introduction for an essay, because it might prompt some analytical paragraphs, or because you think it will help you to remember the ideas related to the theme of Christmas, now's your chance to do so. I really do hope that it helps you out in some way. And here we have some of those extra bits and bobs that I mentioned just a moment ago. Firstly, a question. If you were to sum up the novella's presentation of Christmas in one word and one word only, what would it be and why? You could use this to help you to create a flashcard or a mind map or even a short analytical paragraph. If you did fancy writing that paragraph, you are more than welcome to share your ideas down in the comments section. I love seeing your ideas and I'm usually pretty good at replying to them too. So you know what? You'll even get some feedback from me. Now, if you don't quite fancy doing that, why not consider some further ideas related to the theme of Christmas? For instance, you might want to think about how the appearance of the Christmas ghosts could relate to this theme. There's probably something we could say about the ghosts of Christmas present, don't you think? Or why not think about the religious importance of Christmas? 
does the religious aspect of it appear in the novella at all? And finally, if you would like some recommendations for extra videos or further reading you could do, why not watch my videos on the themes of family and also Christianity and religion? Now that second video isn't actually out yet, so you might want to make sure that you are subscribed so that you get notified of when it does come out. Additionally, you might want to check out the bibliography that I've put in the video description. It's got links to loads of different web pages that will supply you with even more useful contextual information. So if you want more, well, you know where to look. Okay then, with all of those next steps explained, that is my discussion of the theme of Christmas in A Christmas Carol complete. I really do hope that this video has helped you out in some way, either because you are revising for exams, studying A Christmas Carol for the first time, or are otherwise reading Dickens' Christmas Tale and want some of its ideas clarifying. If this video has indeed helped you out, please do consider showing your support by giving this video a like, dropping it a comment, subscribing to my channel if you aren't already, or even sharing it with anyone who you think might find it useful. Doing any of those things helps me out loads, and it also helps me to help out even more people, so everyone's a winner. Anyway, as ever, I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. And if you are revising, please do remember to take frequent short breaks, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. And hey, if you're watching this around Christmas time, have a brilliant Christmas as well. So how does Dickens use the theme of Christmas in his novella? Well, I think he celebrates the festive season for its universality. The way in which, no matter who you are and where you live, you are able to celebrate Christmas and it is able to bring you joy and laughter and love and bliss. But the thing is, I think Dickens is really using the theme of Christmas in order to remind his readers, remember mostly wealthy upper and middle class readers, to hold the Christmas spirit all year round, just like Scrooge learns to, and to therefore be more generous, giving and mindful of those who are less fortunate.